Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. I'm Manuel and today we are diving into my plan to send a CubeSat prototype to the stratosphere on a very large balloon. So this video ended up being a bit too long, therefore I split it up into two parts. In this first part we are going to talk about the basics of a high altitude balloon flight and in the second part we are taking a look at the CubeSat prototype hardware I'm going to fly in June. As you may know, using a high altitude balloon or HAP is a common and relatively affordable way for testing hardware in a near space environment. Importantly, it's only near space because the internationally recognized boundary of space starts at 100 kilometers, whereas with a HAP you only get up to 30, maybe 40 kilometers. A step up in terms of suborbital testing would be launching on a sounding rocket, which is for the moment out of reach for me and also wouldn't make that much sense because it's still very early in the development of this CubeSat. So let's go ahead now and take a look at how a HAB launch works. The basic setup is pretty straightforward. At the top we have a large helium balloon. Tied to that with about 5 meters worth of sturdy nylon string is a parachute. And attached with another 2 or so meters of nylon string is the actual payload. But from here on out, if I say payload, I will refer to everything that is attached to the balloon because the total payload mass drives a lot of the parameters in a HAB launch. The way this works is super simple. The balloon rises and expands as the atmosphere gets thinner. At some point it will burst and the payload will descend on the parachute. The altitude you reach depends on the size of the balloon and the speed of the descent depends on the size of the parachute. So as you can imagine, picking the right sizes of balloon and parachute is critical. But before we get into that, let's take a minute to talk about the two most important things for every HAB launch. Safety and regulations. The safety concerns are kind of obvious. You're sending something up and down through active airspace, so you need to do everything you can to minimize the risk of colliding with another aircraft. The regulations often go hand in hand with that. In Switzerland, where I'm based, you actually don't need a permit as long as you stick to the following rules. The launch site needs to be more than 5 kilometers away from all runways. You can't launch more than 2 kilograms of payload. You can't use flammable gas, so only helium and no hydrogen. And you need a personal liability insurance with a 1 million franc coverage, which roughly equates to 1.3 million US dollars. Regulations may be completely different in your country or perhaps may even be outright prohibited. And also, just to be clear, this video is only a broad overview of the topic. And if you are planning to do a HAB launch, you definitely need to do your own research. I have put a few links in the description to get you started. So this will be my sixth launch and over the years I have added a few things to the basic setup we looked at before. I will also include a highly visible, buoyant and watertight bag, which will hold one of these spot GPS trackers in a styrofoam box. Of course, I hope that my CubeSat prototype will transmit its location, but there is a chance that it won't work, so I need a backup. As a matter of fact, if the mass budget allows, I will even add a second GPS tracker for redundancy. I will also attach a tag with my name and number to the bag in case someone happens upon it after landing before I do. And if we are still within 2 kilos after all of this, I will add a waterproof flashing light to the bag. I have also used a passive radar reflector in the past, but a pilot friend of mine told me that civil aircraft don't have primary radar and flight control will usually not report a random unidentified object, so I will leave it off. I will also not use an ADS-B transmitter because they are not intended for use on UAVs in Switzerland and would need to be certified. I will however use this QRP Labs APRS transmitter to make paragliders aware of the balloon. This device transmits its location on 144 to 146 MHz, so you will need an amateur radio license to operate it, which I got a few years ago. Another safety concern that gets underestimated sometimes is the length of the string connecting the balloon and the parachute. So when the balloon bursts, it's kind of a violent event, and we really want to make sure that no latex debris or the string itself gets entangled in the parachute. Therefore, this line needs to be at least 5 meters long to provide enough separation. Now, the most salient question probably is, how do we know where the payload lands? And to be honest, we don't. Not precisely, at least. Thankfully, there is this trajectory predictor that is free to use in HAPHUB, which is pretty much the go-to resource for anything high-altitude balloon related. For my previous launches, this has turned out to be surprisingly accurate. It needs to know a few things like the location, altitude, time and date of your launch, as well as the ascent rate, burst altitude and descent rate. These last three values we will talk about in a minute in the context of balloon and parachute selection. 
Once you have filled everything out, the tool will use NOAA data to calculate the trajectory the balloon takes as it ascends through the layers of atmosphere, pops and then descends on the parachute. Frankly, this is an amazing tool and I support the maintainers on Patreon. If you want to do the same, the link is in the description. So this gives us an approximate landing area with a radius of about a kilometer or so in my experience. The sensible thing to do is to only launch when this tool tells you that the landing will be in a sparsely populated area. With stronger winds, the predictions become more uncertain, so when this happens, it makes sense to either abort the launch attempt or go up to a lower altitude, which is a great segue into balloon selection. There are of course different manufacturers and vendors, but I use Huawei balloons and get them from Random Engineering in England. Balloon sizes are usually indicated in grams and that's the actual weight of the balloon itself, not the amount of helium it holds. What I have here are three Huawei balloons, 800, 1000 and 1200 grams. These are kind of sensitive, so it's a good idea to store them in a cool, dry and dark place and only handle them with gloves. Because if the latex is weakened, it will burst sooner and this will throw off your trajectory prediction. To pick the right balloon size, we'll use the balloon burst calculator on HapHap. In this calculator, we input our payload mass, select the balloon we're thinking of using, and then define one of two target values. Let's say I want to reach 32 kilometers. This gives us an ascent rate of 5.81 meters per second, which is on the slower side, and a time to burst of 92 minutes. That's quite a long time, meaning the balloon can drift pretty far. If I lower the burst altitude to 30 kilometers, we get a faster ascent rate, 7.26 meters per second, and a shorter time to burst of 69 minutes, which I find much more acceptable. The key value we're looking to get out of this is the neck lift. That's basically the amount of pull the balloon exerts when you hold it by its neck. We'll use that to know how much helium we need to fill it with. And of course, we need the ascent rate and burst altitude for the flight trajectory prediction. So to figure out which size of helium cylinder we need to buy, we divide the balloon's volume at launch by the cylinder's pressure factor. A standard 50 liter industrial helium cylinder at 200 bars contains 10 cubic meters or 10,000 liters of helium at atmospheric pressure. So in this case, with the 6,252 liters in the balloon, we need a bit more than half of a standard 50 liter cylinder. Now you might be wondering why I also have smaller balloon sizes and that's mainly for flexibility. In case the wind speeds are somewhat high on launch day, I might opt to use a smaller balloon and go up to a lower altitude, which would reduce cross-range drift and make for a shorter flight. I would find that preferable to aborting the launch attempt. For filling the balloons, I printed these tubes a few years ago when I still had a resin printer. I made different diameters because the balloon's neck diameter will be different depending on size and manufacturer. On the bottom, I have these quick connect things with an auto shutoff valve, which will connect to a matching piece on some reinforced plastic tubing, which will then connect to the main valve on the helium cylinder with an adapter. These plastic parts are not specifically made for this application, but rather for garden hoses, but they work surprisingly well. The other major decision, aside from choosing a balloon size, is picking a parachute. A larger parachute will naturally mean a slower descent speed, which is generally desirable, but it will also increase cross-range drift, as the payload has more time to be carried by the wind. So this will make the trajectory less predictable and the recovery longer. Um, this here is a three-foot Rocketman parachute that I also got from Random Engineering and it is the smallest size that I have here right now. I also have the four and six-foot variants and I will probably use the six-foot for this flight. As a rule of thumb, your descent speed shouldn't be faster than five meters per second and that's already pretty brisk. So I used the parachute descent rate calculator on randomsolutions.co.uk to figure out the descent speed for my payload weight. Um, let's assume I use the 6-foot Rocketman parachute and my payload is uh, maybe 1.8 kilograms. This will give us a decent speed of 3.73 meters per second, which is completely acceptable. It's rather on the slow side. So if my uh, payload is 2 kilograms on the dot, it will be um, 3.93, which is great. Um, I may even get away with using the 5-foot Rocketman parachute. This would give us a decent rate of uh, 4.71 meters per second, which is still okay, but it's it's getting to be a bit too fast for, for, my, um, for my taste. So just to be on the safe side, I will um, be using the six-foot Rocketman parachute. 
Um, so I think this covers the basics of a high altitude balloon flight. And again, this is just an overview. If you um, want to launch one of those yourself, you should definitely do your own uh, research. Let's maybe talk now about um, why I would want to launch a CubeSat prototype on a HAB in the first place. So for me, um, there are two main categories for purposes for this. The primary purpose is to advance the project. Um, I want to see if I can collect and send back telemetry and maybe images, which will then uh, inform the development of the system. Uh, I will put up a list of uh, kind of questions or objectives here, so you can read through them if you're interested. Um, we'll get into the technical details more in the next video. So I will talk more about the LoRa setup and why I use Wi-Fi on the ground for uh, maybe a live stream downlink and the O4, the DJI O4 system that I will be using as a backup. Now there are also a bunch of secondary purposes that are not directly related to um, CubeSat development. Um, first and foremost, I'm not sure if I have mentioned this before, I am dedicating this flight to a good friend of mine who has um, sadly passed away two years ago. So this will be a memorial flight for my friend Rito. And also this flight is a way for me to share with my friends and family what it is that I'm actually working on. Um, because most of them are not too much into space, uh, space stuff and all of this seems a bit abstract to them. So it's kind of nice for me to, you know, show them the actual thing I, I work on. Um, and also it's just a challenge for me, you know, uh, standing up um, the whole launch and putting the, the whole uh, a, a complete system together is kind of a, it's a big and challenging task and it puts me on a, on a deadline. So um, I've been working pretty intensely on this and I've also been making a bunch of progress in different parts of the, of the project. So it kind of um, provides some momentum to the, to the project, which is um, a good thing. And also there's just some fun technical stuff that I'm looking forward to, to trying out. For example, I will be using a directional Wi-Fi antenna and I'm interested in seeing how far this reaches or will the DJI 04 backup video um, downlink work at all and will we be able to live stream the whole thing? Yeah, stuff like that. And then the, the recovery of the payload itself is a bit of a scavenger hunt, so I'm also looking forward to this. Now certainly there are also limitations in terms of the kind of insights this type of testing can actually pro provide for CubeSat development. Um, since this video is already getting quite long probably, I'll just put them up as, as text here and you can pause and read through them if you're interested. But the uh, TLDR is that for more systematic and controlled testing of a CubeSat prototype, you'd typically use ground-based facilities like a vibration table, a thermal vacuum chamber and a anechoic chamber for EMI testing. Um, none of these are avail available to me right now, though I hope they will be in the future. And that being said, it also wouldn't be that much, it wouldn't make that much sense to run those kinds of more um, elaborate tests and also more expensive tests at this stage anyway, because it's really still early days in the development of this uh, CubeSat. So for now, I'm going to do these um, high altitude balloon test flights and honestly, I'm having a great time doing it. So in the next video, we're going to look at the hardware I'm planning to launch on this flight. Thank you very much for watching all the way through. Let me know if you like this video and I'll see you in the next one.